Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Judge Glock. Judge is an economic historian and a scholar at the Cicero Institute in San Francisco. Judge's research has focused on the Great Depression and has recently published a paper on an important idea shaping Fed policy during this time. The idea was the Rifler Keynes Doctrine. Judge joins us today to discuss this paper and the Great Depression. Judge, welcome to the show. A real pleasure to be here. A longtime listener, David, so uh, happy to be a participant too. Well, thank you. And and I can say this honestly, that this paper was really one of the, the few papers I've read in a long time that really opened my eyes, really some new thinking, some ideas. And it really, to me, stressed the importance of the history of economic thought, why it's important to go back and look at what people have discussed before. And as we get into your paper, we'll see that some of the recent debates really aren't so new. Um before we get into all of that, I want to ask you, how did you get into economic history? How did you get into this topic of the Great Depression in the first place? Well, I, I of course, a long time interest in it, even in undergrad when I was a history major. Uh, but when I went back to grad school in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, uh, again, in to get a PhD in history, I knew I wanted to study uh, financial crises. And of course, uh, the Great Depression was paramount there. It helped that when I was going to grad school in Rutgers that I was right next to the economics department there, which has a fantastic financial history section. I think some of whom you've had on the show, Hugh Rockoff and Michael Bordo and uh, Eugene White, who was my uh, advisor during my time there. Uh, So I got a really great background in financial and monetary history, and uh, that certainly informed uh, my my dissertation and some of uh, the work that emerged out of it, including this paper. So. Wow, those are some great scholars. I need to get Eugene White on the show. He's definitely a great uh, banking scholar, too. So Yeah, he knows backwards and forwards. He does. He does. Fantastic. Okay. Well, let's talk about the Great Depression as a way to get into your paper. And just for our listeners who don't know, who may have forgotten, remind us about the Great Depression. What are the stylized facts about it? Uh, yes. Yeah, so one of the things I often used to discuss with my students is it's almost impossible to overemphasize the importance and impact of the Great Depression. And once you start thinking about it, the the ramifications of it seem to kind of ripple outwards as far as the eye can see. Uh, So from 1929 to about 1933, and the global industrial production dropped by a third, seemingly uh, with no supply side cause, as far as anyone could tell, no massive famines, no uh, industrial disasters, just across the globe, you saw a very sudden collapse in uh, production, GDP. Uh, This was accompanied by a massive uh, collapse in prices across most of the globe too, about a 33% decline in the price level. Uh, United States was the worst hit of all, even though it was by far the richest and most industrialized country. Its industrial production dropped by over around 45% in this period. Uh, before re, uh, recovering very quickly in the U.S. and elsewhere, uh, as we'll discuss later, when uh, the United States and other countries got off the gold standard, leading to uh, very sudden spikes in, in aggregate demand and sudden increases in gross domestic uh, production. Uh, so that that sort of global economic collapse, uh, the level of the collapse, the, the, cr- the amount of the collapse across many different countries, was sort of unprecedented and uh, has never happened before or since. At the same time, the political ramifications, as many people pointed out, are perhaps even more important, the most significant of which is the rise of the Nazis in Germany, which can be pretty confidently laid at the feet of the the Great Depression, which therefore, of course, caused World War II, uh, the rise of communism in Eastern Europe, basically uh, any sort of disaster you can think of in the last half of the 20th century. So, Understanding why this collapse happened is has been essential to both macroeconomics, political historians, almost anyone who studies the 20th century, uh, and uh, people are still continuing to wrestle with it. It's uh, if we don't understand this, we're not going to understand a lot about uh, 
why uh, some of the great disasters of the 20th century took place. And it's, uh, as Ben Bernanke said, it is sort of the holy grail of macroeconomics, too, and with good reason. Yes. And there's some other, what I would call stylized facts, I just wanted to highlight that you've touched on. And, and that is, you know, how long did it last? It lasted roughly a decade. Is that correct? Well, yes. If you look at the actual collapse, is, say, in the United States, in gross domestic product, that basically lasted from from 29 to 33. Okay. But we had unemployment rates that were continuing in the double digits, 15, 16 percent, up until around 1940, 1941. And obviously today, that's even you would think 10 years after the start of the Great Depression, uh, a double digit unemployment rate higher than even the worst of the great of what we suffered during the recent Great Recession seems like a continuing recession in many cases. So the length of the Great Depression and the, the slowness of the recovery over the long term was a big part of what made it so disastrous. Uh, but in other countries uh, had different levels of recovery at different times. But as I said before, the U.S. did happen to be both the, the largest total collapse and the slowest to recover. So we suffered uh, the brunt of it. Yeah. There was this huge gap in the U.S. economic production, well below where we should be for almost a decade. And you mentioned the, this first contraction, which is, I think, often called the Great Contraction, 29 yes. to 33. The economy literally gets smaller and smaller. There's another second contraction, 36, 37? Basically, uh, from late 37 to, to early 38. 38, called, okay. Yeah. So you got two, recession. two outright contractions, very slow recovery. So there's still this all this excess capacity, lots of unemployment for whole decades, hugely consequential. Uh, there, there's also the story told of a real sharp recovery in 1933. Maybe we'll come back to that later after we talk about your paper. But a real sharp recovery in 1933 that's often tied to FDR going off gold. And then you know, that's like a great recovery. It's kind of stalled. And then you don't see the real true recovery, the, the standard story tells us at least, until World War II. And I know there's a critique of that story as well. But the standard story is World War II is what finally got us free from that. And one of the other kind of underlying stories is that the Federal Reserve really blew it. And Milton Friedman really stressed this. And he kind of rewrote the, the story on how consequential money is with his famous history book of, of money throughout the U.S. history. But one of the, the stories I think most people take for granted now is the Fed could have done more, but it didn't do more. So I want to segue into your paper, which I mentioned before is a great discussion of what the Fed was thinking during this period. And it really shed some new light on their views on monetary policy. But before we get into it and, and what it means, and it's going to touch on long-term interest rates, maybe you can share what the Fed was thinking before then, what was the context leading up to this important um, issue the Reifler Keynes doctrine, and let us you know what what's the stage being set before we kind of get into the discussion of this doctrine. Uh, sure. Uh, so ever since basically uh, Friedman and Schwartz's uh, monetary history of the United States in, in 1962, there's been a broad consensus that the Federal Reserve was central in uh, both causing and exacerbating the Great Depression. So there's, of course, been a, a concomitant concern, then what exactly was the Fed thinking? If the ramifications of the Great Depression are as severe as, as we have pointed out they are, then this puts a lot of weight on trying to understand basically what 12 central bankers, the 12 central uh, Federal Reserve Bank governors were thinking in this period from, from 1929 to 1933. Uh, whatever they were thinking in some sense shaped the entire course of of human history. And so we really need to understand what was going on in their heads. Before Friedman and Schwartz came along, there wasn't much concern about this because most people thought the Federal Reserve had basically done everything it could do to prevent the Great Depression. People like John Maynard Keynes himself and some others said, look, the amount of base money in the United States increased during this period. Uh, interest rates were very low. Uh, by that measure, we were in a liquidity trap. There was nothing much the Fed could do. And therefore, understanding what they were thinking wasn't important because uh, the economy must have been collapsing for some other reason. But when Friedman and Schwartz showed that, well, if you look at a broader definition of the money supply, M2 in their period, uh, as they discussed it, then clearly the Fed was letting money supply collapse, and we have to understand why they were doing that. According to Friedman and Schwartz, uh, the main reason was uh, 
uh, a tuberculosis bacillus that crept into Benjamin Strong's lungs in the late 19 teens. Benjamin Strong being the governor of the New York Federal Reserve Bank and an active exponent of expansionary mon monetary policy. But unfortunately, according to Friedman Shorts, after Benjamin Strong died, the Federal Reserve basically took a contractionary view of monetary policy. They looked too much at short-term interest rates, and they looked and thought that they were being expansionary, when in fact they were being very contractionary. On other hand, they thought uh, the, many people in the Federal Reserve actually wanted a contraction because that would supposedly liquidate some of the bad speculation out of the system. And that was their sort of logic to what uh, the Federal Reserve was thinking. Judge, let me ask this question. So just to be clear, that was a reasonable take, given what you, you hinted at earlier. There there were 12 central banks, effectively, 12 effectively independent, which is very different than today, right? So each regional bank could set monetary policy in its district. Is that right? That's correct. So they were somewhat organized since 1923 under what later been known, uh, became known as the Federal Open Market Committee. But uh, basically, they had a fair amount of discretion in terms of uh, the discount rates they set, how many securities they purchased. Uh, these decisions were often appealable to the Board of Governors in D.C., but at that time, the Board of Governors was less, much less substantial and powerful than these 12 independent uh, Federal Reserve Bank governors. And so, yes, these people were the real uh, powers behind monetary policy in this period. And when Friedman and Schwartz looked at, those were the people they looked at uh, to see what their logic and uh, thought processes were at the time. Yeah, so when the most important regional bank president dies, it, it would seem on the surface at least consequential to what the Fed's going to be doing. But uh, tell, tell the rest of the story. Okay, and so I, I guess I, I'll keep going on, on about some of the, the previous – yeah, the previous thoughts about what the, the Federal Reserve was thinking. Uh, the next major contribution uh, to this to this history and, and the one that kind of survives up to the present in which – I'm discussing in my paper is the, the Alan Meltzer and Carl Bruner argument, uh, what they call the Rifler Burgess Doctrine. Uh, now, uh, I sh to get into that, we need to do uh, confront two issues that were, uh, or one main issue that was important in the Rifler Burgess Doctrine, and that is the Real Bills Doctrine. Should I, I go into that? Yeah, for tell, a tell our listeners what that is. So this idea, often traced as going back to Adam Smith, is that basically because a bank relies on short-term liabilities, its deposits, it should also rely on very short-term assets, often what's described commercial paper, usually 60 to 90 days due. Adam Smith had a famous sort of uh, metaphor where he described a bank should be like a pond where a river is always flowing in and a river is always flowing out of it to keep the level stable. And many people took this view to say as long as a central bank was merely discounting short-term commercial paper, the 60-90 day commercial paper. That meant it was only responding to, quote, the real needs of trade. And that meant it wasn't being either expansionary or contractionary. Uh, so, well, if people are offering you commercial paper, then you're, uh, you should accept it and discount it. And if they're not, then you shouldn't worry about it. On the other hand, this did leave an important variable sort of uh, unexplained, and that's the interest rate. Of course, it's a very different situation if a central bank is not being offered any paper to discount when it's offering a 15 percent discount rate versus when it's offering a 1 percent discount rate. Basically, if it's charging more to loan its money uh, or charging less to loan its money. So what Alan Meltzer and Carl Bruner brought to this was to say, look, if you look at the Federal Reserve in this period, they were obsessed with what this this Reifler Burgess doctrine. And they said Reifler Burgess was said that they could measure the right amount of the right level of interest rates by how much these banks were borrowing from the Federal Reserve and how much open market purchases the Federal Reserve was doing at the time. So if banks weren't borrowing, if weren't borrowing too much, that meant the interest rate was probably uh, about right. But if they weren't borrowing at all, uh, that might mean it was uh, it was too high or too low. And they could use open market purchases to affect the level of interest rates at the, the level of discounting at the same time that uh, they were using the discount window to also affect uh, the amount of reserves in the system. And hopefully that's not too complicated, but 
just for the, the sake of the, the program, important to remember that at the time, uh, the Federal Reserve had two important levers of monetary policy. One was the discounting window and the discount rate, and the other was either buying or selling government bonds, which would either put uh, more or less money into the economy, respectively. And the Reifler Burgess Doctrine was about trying to get the right level of short term interest rates uh, and the right level of commercial bank borrowing from the Federal Reserve to make this real bills doctrine effective. Now, my understanding of the real bills doctrine is that it was a terrible idea insofar as it made pro cyclical monetary policy. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, if no one's offering a paper to the Federal Reserve, that could be become you're in a horrible recession and the interest rates are too high relative to an equilibrium rate. And therefore, the real, bill, real bills doctrine can exacerbate that, that problem. Okay, so how does the real bills doctrine tie into the idea that you develop in your paper, the, the Reifler Keynes doctrine? So, yes. Okay, so this, the, this gets us to... The, the innovations uh, of the Reifler, what I call the Reifler-Keynes Doctrine, what some people at the time actually called the Reifler-Keynes Doctrine, which was, first of all, the first most important part was that short-term interest rates are a bad measure of the effectiveness of monetary policy. Now, not in the sense of some things we would think today, such as, well, it's dependent on expectations of future inflation or deflation, but more so in the sense because short-term interest rates don't have a significant impact on investment. That was the first important sort of contribution of the Reifler Keynes doctrine. Uh, people like Wesley Clare Mitchell, famous professor, uh, Columbia teacher of Arthur Burns, and who later taught Milton Friedman, said, "Look, when you look at most businesses and their balance sheet, an increase of one or two percent on uh, short-term borrowing doesn't make a big difference." What does make a big difference is the, the borrowing on long-term interest rates, that an interest rate increase of 1% or 2% for an investment that would last for 5 to 10 years would make a very significant impact on the amount of borrowing and therefore would make an impact on the amount of investment. And therefore, since we could, as far as they could tell, this sort of long-term fixed investment tended to lead the business cycle, maybe these long-term interest rates were much more essential in terms of determining business cycles up and downs than the previous real bills theorists had thought. Okay, so the first key idea is what really matters is long-term interest rates for the economy. Short-term rates aren't as consequential. Absolutely. The, now, the second key idea, walk us through that, and, and I believe that is that the Fed could influence those long-term rates. Is that right? That's correct. So, uh when people like Wesley Clare Mitchell mentioned that long-term rates were important in the business cycle, that didn't seem to offer much policy uh, ideas for, for the Federal Reserve, for other central banks, because the Federal Reserve uh, was set up, like most central banks, only to loan on short-term commercial paper. They were still, to an extent, influenced by this real bills doctrine, that that's the job of a central bank to give liquidity and discounts to this short-term commercial paper. Uh, but another theorist, Harold Moulton, uh, at the time, later the head of the Brookings Institute, said, well, no, there's this kind of national unified money market, uh, something we don't think of as, as that kind of uh, surprising today. But any sort of lending on the short term moves its way into the long-term investment market. And he said, well, you can look at this by looking at the actual commercial banks and practices. The commercial banks, just like the Federal Reserve itself, were supposed to loan only on short-term short commercial paper. In fact, it was illegal for most of the commercial banks in the United States to do things like make mortgages or make very long-time investment loans. But he said, in practice, these commercial banks renew these short-term loans over and over and over again. And so they function like long-time investment loans. And so even if the Federal Reserve pumps excess money into the economy, uh, just through the short-term market, this is going to migrate over into the long-term market, and that's going to affect these sort of uh, long-term investments that Wesley Clare Mitchell talked about. So here now we have an opportunity for the Federal Reserve to start thinking about how its short-term interest rate policy can affect that long-term rate and therefore the business cycle. So was he thinking through a theory that's very similar to segmented markets we would say today, or is it similar to the expectation theory of long-term rates today? Any relation? 
Well, so later on, it wouldn't be till later that they would formulate something as clear as sort of either a preferred habitat or yes, yeah, segmented markets or expectations theory of the of the term structure of interest rates. Uh, but at the same time, they were trying to think about how uh, certain markets they would probably be closest to that kind of segmented market idea, partially okay. and but not totally. And that one of these, there was different sorts of demands for borrowing in different sorts of markets. Uh, but the sort of supply side, the credit that went into it could be uh, can influence all the different interest rates uh, short to long term. OK, so again, the first insight or the first idea of this doctrine is that long term rates are more important for the economy than short term rates in terms of monetary policy. Number two, the Fed's able to influence in theory, could influence those long-term rates. And the third key doctrine is that the Fed could make the debt more liquid or what you call shiftable, the term they use, shiftable. So explain that third point. Uh, yes. Yeah, so the, how we think of liquidity today is very distinct to how they used to think about liquidity around the time of the founding of the Federal Reserve. And that was a bill or debt is liquid if it comes due soon. If a bill comes due in 30 days or 90 days, that's a fairly liquid bill. Uh, a five-year bond or whatever else length of a bond at that distance is not going to be very liquid. Today, we think of basically what uh, began to be called in the 1920s the shiftability theory of liquidity, which is, well, any debt or asset can be made potentially liquid if you can sell it to someone else, a stronger bank or another bank. So some of the, the similar advocates, a lot of them coming out of the uh, what was called the institutional-ish school of, uh, of economic thought, said, well, we can set up commercial banks to make all of this these assets shiftable, or as we would today call it, just liquid. They don't have to rely just on short-term ter short -term liquid assets, 60, 90 days due, because if they're able to pawn off an asset uh, to another bank or ideally even to a central bank, Every single asset on their balance sheet can be equally liquid. And that's another way to get the, the interest rates on these long-term debts and assets down because the increased liquidity of that is going to make central banks more – or sorry, commercial banks more comfortable at investing in them and it's going to increase investment in these, uh, in these sorts of assets. So both these measures, opening up potentially the short-term uh, discounting and amount of money going into the short-term market – and two, potentially more long-term changes through the ability of commercial banks to invest or the ability even of the Federal Reserve to buy these sort of short uh, long-term assets can also push down the interest rate on the crucial long-term uh, debts and assets. Yeah, so the Reifler Keynes doctrine sounds a lot like some of the thinking today, right? Some of the thinking today is, and we saw that over the past decade, let's go out on the yield curve, let's, let's buy up 10-year treasuries, let's try to lower the interest rate that's offered. So it, it seems some of the same ideas we're talking about today were being discussed back then. I, I think so, exactly. If you look at a lot of the language, and we'll get into this, of uh, both Federal Reserve researchers and officials at the time, it, it seems not too distant from we, what we think of as, as contemporary New Keynesian policy. It, it is really focused on the effect of interest rates, especially long-term interest rates on investment. Fixed investment, a lot of what Ben Bernanke and Gertler and some others have said in the last uh, 20, 30 years really emphasize this point. And this point was emphasized again in the in the 2008 crisis. So in in this sense, I think you can find a lot more similarities between what the Federal Reserve and policymakers were thinking in, in 1929 and what they were also thinking in, in 2008. And obviously, the circumstances drove it, right? So they had a very sharp contraction then. We had a sharp contraction here. You get near the zero lower bound. Maybe that also motivates some of the thinking. Let's, let's go beyond just short-term interest rates. But it is still very stunning. And again, this is why this paper was was so uh, interesting to me that I hadn't seen this discussion before. And, and again, just to stress the role of teaching the history of economic thought, maybe more of us would know about this. But but let's be clear: this um, doctrine, this Reifler Keynes doctrine, your article is really the first one to kind of pull it all together and to be published on this, right? Uh, that's correct. So the term Reifler Keynes theory or Reifler Kane doctrine, I found at least in two different published sources in the, in the 1930s. So this was a contemporary term, unlike the the Reifler Burgess doctrine, which which Alan Meltzer admitted he kind of uh, 
that he came up with as a combination of these previous ideas that he thought were related. People at the time were referring to both Reifler and, as we'll get to in a second, John Maynard Keynes in the same breath and thinking that these two individuals and some of the other economists around them had similar ideas about what should be done to counteract a, a depression. And as I hope I show, this was these ideas were very prominent both in the Hoover and Roosevelt administrations and in the Federal Reserve itself. Yeah. So now when professors teach history of economic thought, they can use your paper thanks to your hard work. Um, so. But again, this is just so striking how relevant this is to discussions today. So not only do we talk about large scale asset purchases and QE of the past decade done by the Federal Reserve, Bank, Bank of England, the European Central Bank, Bank of Japan. But there's now talk about doing things such as yield curve control, and, and Bank of Japan is doing that. They're, they're trying to keep the 10-year Treasury yield at a certain value, but others have been talking about it. This year, you know, the Fed's having a review of its policies. One of the points that have come up is should the Fed think about yield curve control? And then on top of this, I think what makes this extra relevant is the fact that long-term yields have been declining. They've been declining a lot. This kind of secular decline in, in, in ten-year treasuries, which are typically the benchmark interest rate all across the advanced economies. You know, Germany's had close to zero, slightly negative. Switzerland's been very negative. U.S. is is pretty low, around two percent. And I was just reading um, today about some countries that now have one hundred-year bonds. Austria, Belgium, and Ireland have one hundred-year bonds. And and this is even more surprising. The University of California system has a one hundred-year bond out as well. But what's what I think is going to happen, this is just my prediction here, if we continue to see um, this decline in long-term rates so that the 10 years get really low, I think we're going to start seeing governments issuing more you know, long, long-term, 50-year bonds, 100-year bonds. And so the debates they had in the 1930s about adjusting long-term rates is going to be moving out on the yield curve possibly even farther. That, that's speculation, but I think this discussion is relevant because it could be possible yeah, so we could go back to the, the 18th century where the British government admitted its consuls, which were indefinite bonds. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Until the end of time. Who knows? Right. So, I mean, unless some kind of shock comes along that brings us out of this kind of secular stagnation trap, um, in my mind, it's not a far-fetched scenario where we do get 10-year treasuries in the U.S. getting really, really low, so the treasury looks you know beyond that, or monetary policy looks beyond that. But let's let's go on with the development of this idea. So you you mentioned some individuals already, um, but you also mentioned in your paper that in addition to these individuals who are involved in the policy world, um, John Maynard Keynes he embraced this idea as well. So tell us about his um, participation in this debate. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So he. Uh, if we look at John Maynard Keynes in the early 1920s, he sort of declared himself a dyed-in-the-wool quantity theorist, which, like their later uh, progen later ancestors, basically looked at the quantity and supply of money, uh, the demand and supply of money, to see the tightness and looseness of monetary policy. By the end of the 1920s, he became much more interest in, interested in the effects of interest rates, and especially of the effects of long-term interest rates. So some of the previous researchers of on Keynes, uh, probably butcher the name, but I think it's Axel uh, Leibenhoven, Hovid, uh, said that, listen, when Keynes talks about interest rates in most of his 1930s work, he's talking about long-term interest rates. And this is often missed in the sort of discussions of ISLM curves or the interpretation of Keynes. Keynes in the Treatise on Money and some of his other works said very clearly the real impact of monetary policy is through investment and long-term fixed investment and particularly the impact of long-term interest rates on fixed investment. And if you look at the Treaties of Money too, in 1930, he uh, said I'll, he quoted pages and pages of Winfield Reifler's work. So both the other half of the Reifler Keynes doctrine and the other half of the Reifler Burgess doctrine. Uh, to say that, look, here's evidence that this Winfield Reifler, then working at the Federal Reserve at the time, uh, compiled that shows there's this very close movement between short-term and long-term rates, that short-term rates are going to affect long-term rates. And there's also evidence, going back to some of the other theorists I mentioned, that these long-term rates are the real determinant of the business cycle. And so he says, 
already in the early 1930s, if we want to get out of this slump, the real thing we can do is try to lower these short-term rates to hopefully have an effect on these long-term rates. And that's what's going to move us out of the already burgeoning depression right now. Winfield Reifler was also saying the same things as he was working at the research division of the Fed to some of his bosses. And so we can discuss some of the policymakers in the Fed that were abiding by these same ideas. Yeah. Before we jump into the, the Fed's adoption or embracing of this idea, a little bit more on Winfield Reifler. So he has a book I believe is kind of key, kind of a catalyst, because you mentioned Keynes extensively cited Reifler's book. But the book's title was Money Rates and the Money Markets in the United States, 1930. So was this book kind of the big bombshell or was it just kind of building on the shoulders of, of the previous individuals you mentioned, like Wesley Clark Mitchell? Uh, yeah, uh, to, to an extent, it was the empirical bombshell. To a okay. lot of people, it seemed to give the, the empirical evidence the previous theoretical work lacked. And there was a chart in this book that I reproduced in my paper and that and that John Maynard Keynes also reproduced in his book. I, I think one of the few charts he's ever reproduced from someone else's work, where Keynes was, of course, not a, a big fan of, of sharing praise when he could avoid <laughs> it. Uh, but... Uh, that seemed to show just over the past 11 years before the book was published that short-term and long-term rates moved in almost perfect synchronicity. Uh, and this seemed to show a lot of people these previous ideas that the institutionalists had talked about maybe had some some truth to them and also provided some pretty sharp money, uh, evidence on terms of how these long-term rates affected total investment in the economy. And so this book provided the, the evidence people needed to say, wait, this is the, uh, the best uh, – measures we have of how monetary policy is working in the real economy. And a lot of the, the evidence, though, he was taking from Federal Reserve uh, research, information, data, tables, and so on that were being used at the Federal Reserve at the exact same time. Yeah, I, I looked at that graph with some interest, and, and this isn't particularly relevant to our discussion, but just it, it struck me, you know, writing a book in 1930 where you have these detailed graphs. It must have been a real chore back then. You know, they don't have Excel or any kind of word processor. But in any event, the book was important. It shaped a lot of thinking. It, it kind of it was a culmination of, of thought of these institutionalist uh, economists you mentioned already. I, I would just also mention a few other names, Alvin Hansen, Alan Young. Of course, Alvin Hansen is known for his secular stagnation views in, at this time as well. So it, it made a lot of sense that he would, he would be a, on board with this. But this book, okay, it arrives in 1930. Tell us how its influence kind of seeps into the, the, the Fed and, and what players at the Fed are important in promoting this understanding. Uh, yes. Yeah, so if, if you look at the people at some of the top positions of the Fed, they seem to – be full-throated supporters of the general Rifler Bird or Rifler Keynes doctrine ideas that uh, long-term interest rates are the most important, that short-term rates affects long rates, and that you can try to increase the shiftability of long-term assets. So one of the other most important believers this is Randolph Burgess, uh, the other half of the supposed Rifler Rifler Burgess doctrine, who was writing uh, articles in 1930 and 1931 about Credit is important primarily, primarily through its effect on the availability of long-term money and the effect of uh, interest rates on the security market and mortgage market. Uh, most importantly, probably the, the greatest believer in it was George Harrison, who was the president after Benjamin Strong at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and would be for the next four or five years would say pretty consistently in federal open market committee meetings and internal memorandum and elsewhere that the main effect of monetary policy is by of reducing long-term interest rates and spurring fixed investment. And you see these concerns come out even in memos in late 1928 and 1929. They showed a lot of, they have charts that go into the Federal Open Market Committee hearing uh, meetings that say, that show pretty clearly when long-term interest rates go up, a particular fixed investment, most especially building, tended to go down. And even when they were raising interest rates in 1929 to squelch the uh, the supposed stock market boom, uh, George Harrison, Randolph Burgess, Winfield Reifler, and others were saying we're already concerned to the effect of these high long-term interest rates on the construction industry and fixed investment. And after the collapse, uh, when they say when they start loosening monetary policy and lowering interest rates, they say very time and again. What we need to do is lower interest rates to spur construction, increase fixed investment, and lower long-term interest rates. 
Yeah, it's interesting in, in the article you outline how George Harrison, which, as you said, was the president of the New York Fed, wrote a memo, I believe in 1930, that he he sent out to all the other presidents. He's, he really needed to convince them, you know, to um, the, the understanding of this doctrine and why it was important to lower long-term yields, which, again, this speaks to this this challenge where you got 12 regional banks. They're effectively – at this time, setting monetary policy, and there's some effort to coordinate. And I just wonder, you know, we're going to speculate here, but if, if Benjamin Strong had been alive at this time, number one, would he have bought into this doctrine? And number two, you know, could he have convinced all the other 12, other 11 banks to um, join in and in, in pushing down long-term yields? It's, yeah, it's hard to know, of course. And uh, on one level, a lot of previous researchers have just kind of divided the reserve bank presidents or governors at the time into expansionary and contractionary camps and kind of left it at that. Uh, but I think it is important to see why these these governors thought certain policies were expansionary or contractionary and when they thought they were expansionary or contractionary. So someone like George Hare, and this gets perhaps even to the, the potential problems with the Rifler or Rifler Keynes doctrine at the time. Someone like Harrison, most of the time, was much more a believer in what we think of as expansionary monetary policy than others. Uh, the quote you mentioned, he sent around a sort of round robin letter to all the Reserve Bank presidents, and I'll, I'll read it, uh, just at least a, a short passage yeah, of it. Yeah, do that. Uh, it says, in previous business depressions, recovery has never taken place until there's been a strong bond market through which new enterprise requiring long-time capital may be financed. As indicated in the attached chart, likely done by Winfield Rifler, whenever the Federal Reserve System embarked upon a program of purchasing government securities in the short term, the bond market has become much more active and stronger, since short-time money becomes less profitable in comparison with long-time money, and thus money shifts to the later market, including some uh, similar related quotes there at the end. Um but this sent this around, and some people in the, the Federal Reserve Open Market Committee basically said this. Eugene Black, later became the governor of the Federal Reserve Board, said, believe the Federal Reserve System has a responsibility toward the bond market, uh, towards financing new enterprise and furnishing long-time capital. Uh, other places like Charles Hanlon said, low rates for short-term borrowing will eventually help long-term borrowing. Uh, but this wasn't universal. So I have other quotes from George Norris of the Philadelphia Reserve Bank, who says, you know, this is counter to everything we were taught to believe. Uh, he says, if I understand the reasoning correctly, the policy of buying government securities is justified by some arguments such as this. We're in a period of depression characterized by following commodity prices. This condition cannot be corrected by an increase of building activity. Building activity we brought about by low rates for long time loans. Low rates for long-time loans will only come with a strong and active bond market. Therefore, we should bring about this condition of the bond market by making short-time credit so cheap that banks and investors will be driven to the bond market to utilize their funds. And he was against it. He said, well, that does numerous leaps of logic in there don't make sense to me and to my understanding of that. Uh, but that's kind of one of the best descriptions we have of what he was countering to see it even then as sort of the main uh, impetus of thought at the Federal Reserve at the time. And... On the whole, I, I think we can say that, as Alan Meltzer and others have pointed out, people like George Harrison and Winfield Rifler got their way at the, at the Federal Reserve Open Market Committee meetings. Even though there was these divisions, they, in large part, directed the the, the open market policies and uh, interest rates for the next three or four years, which obviously was not quite enough to uh, to alleviate or over to, or uh, uh, prevent the depression. I think you can make an even stronger case, Judge, and you do this in your paper by bringing in a discussion of President Hoover during this time. So President Hoover and Harrison of the New York Fed were, were close friends, and apparently Harrison convinced Hoover of the Rifler Keynes doctrine. Is that right? Uh, that's right. If, if you look, uh, Hoover, of course, is famous for some misstatements about the about the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. uh, a few, uh, I believe, even weeks after the the stock market crash, he said. Famously said, the, the fundamental business of America is strong and secure. And everyone quotes this as a sort of obviously, uh, in hindsight, ridiculous statement. But they all forget in the same speech, he, he 
noted one thing that he thought was potentially destructive and that they had to worry about. And he said the high long term interest rates have inhibited construction and building activity. And these need to be corrected if we're going to begin on an upswing again. Uh, so George Harrison, who some people said was, quote, the top man in the, in the Hoover administration, at least for a period, uh, certainly uh, got Hoover to believe in this theory. And he gave numerous speeches over the next year and a half about the real goal was to make get short term money to move into the long term market and eventually help construction and fixed investment. And he eventually, too, uh, helped change the Federal Reserve Board in Washington, D.C. because of this. He basically put Eugene Meyer who was a believer in the Reichler Keynes doctrine and said in numerous fashions before and afterwards uh, that these ideas were sound uh, to replace Roy Young and one other Federal Reserve Board governor, kind of a, a coup at the board. Yeah, I uh, thought of Donald Trump when I was reading this. It's like, wow, <laughs> President well, Hoover it kind of paved the way for President Trump in terms of replacing Fed chairs. And of course, back then, I guess the board, the, the board of governors wasn't as powerful or as consequential at that time, right? It, exactly. It wasn't as consequential as the as the Reserve Bank governors, but uh, it does. There's been speculation ever since 19 September 1930 that Hoover might have had something to do with this. I found some some letters in the Hoover Library and in the Charles Hamlin diaries that this was probably so that uh, Hoover probably engineered the then current head of the Federal Reserve Board uh, to leave and move into the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston and kicked out one other uh, board member in order so we could place their own, uh, his own members on, on the board. And later on, people like Charles Hamlin complained about what he called the board's hooverizing. Hooverizing, nice. The increasing obsequiousness with which the board treated Hoover's request. And in that sense, uh, Eugene Myers, the new head of the board, tried to be as operationally involved as possible. And he... Uh, attended the Federal Open Market Committee meetings, uh, said very clearly, uh, one quote I had in the paper is uh, that he told the, the committees, the whole history of investment showed that money would go from the short term into the long term channels uh, and said this was one of his main focus. Uh, so in these senses, he was Hoover, too, was trying to push the Reifler Keynes doctrine. And this was his you can even argue his main focus in the first two years, of the depression in terms of how he thought it was going to uh, reverse it. Yeah, since the Board of Governors didn't have a lot of teeth, not really powerful, all they could really do is cheerlead, and he was the big cheerleader for the Reifler Keynes doctrine. So the, the point I think you're making here, you're, you're painting a picture that this doctrine was very well understood, it was cited, it was promoted by many people within the Fed. And so the question is, well, did it matter? And there are two ways it could matter. One, did they take steps to influence long-term rates? And then, and then two, um, how did it affect monetary policy in the Great Depression in terms of its response to the Great Depression? So let's tackle the first one first, the, the first point. And you do give evidence that they actually did take concrete steps to influence long-term rates. And one of the most surprising points you make on this is that the QE program they did in 1932, or it was sort of a QE program, I guess, a large-scale asset purchase program. Afterwards, they went back and they extended the mat average maturity of their holdings from this purchase. Oh, yes, absolutely. So a lot of people have written about the uh, – in early 1932, the Federal Reserve Board uh, and bank governors, after a, a change in the law that Hoover uh, had pushed – uh, began purchasing hundreds of millions of dollars of government securities in the open market with the hope of flooding the banks with excess reserves and encouraging increased lending. But at the same time, they were beginning to move into this sort of shiftability aspect of the Reifler Keynes doctrine. Beginning in the late 1930s, John Maynard Keynes, Reifler, and others noticed that the long-term interest rates didn't seem to be responding as much to the changes in short-term interest rates as they had previously. All this evidence they'd had of an interconnected monetary market and uh, a close connection between the two rates that seemed to disappear in the Great Depression itself. And so they were flooding all this short-term money into the market, but long-term rates had moved down very slowly. Uh, John Maynard Keynes says if he, this disequilibrium dis between short and long-term rates, as far as he could tell, was the fundamental reason for the global slump. And so Keynes, Reifler, and others said, well, we, that means we have to act directly on long-term rates. And that's not just doing something like QE. That's actually making direct investment in long-term assets, which was 
absolutely verboten in any central bank of the period, but began to be undertaken by the Fed. Uh, I don't think anyone else has written about the uh, the change in the Fed's maturity structure in this period. But if you look, uh, Michael Board, I think, actually has done a little bit of this in the early 1932 period. But if you look at it, before early 1932, before about May in that year, the Federal Reserve uh, had no government securities of less than of greater than one year uh, till maturity. So by night, the end of 1932, it's over 25 percent of their of their assets are over one year maturity. About seven or eight percent of those are over three years maturity. And by the 1935 period, over the majority of Federal Reserve Bank assets are actually in uh, government bonds of over one mere, uh, year maturity. So in a sense, they're trying to do an early operation twist here. They're yeah. trying not just increase the the total size of their their balance sheet, but also shift a focus on these long term assets. But they also created, as I mentioned, a lot of other things of what we would think of as facilities of the Federal Reserve, uh, like where they created in 2008. Now, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation uh, when it was created in February 1932, around the same time as the, the first beginning of the QE program, uh, was basically there uh, as an adjunct to the Federal Reserve. It was run by Eugene Meyer. Uh, their offices were housed in the Federal Reserve buildings, and they were there explicitly to buy up assets that it was illegal for the Federal Reserve itself to buy up, which basically meant these long-term private securities. Uh, so the Reconstruction Finance Corporation would buy long-term bonds, even some equities occasionally, eventually would buy mortgages. Uh, and at the same time, uh, Hoover also set up the uh, the federal home loan banks, which had a similar sort of motivation. These federal home loan banks were a way to give liquidity, as he said, to small independent mortgages, which in that point didn't have any liquidity, basically were on the books of small local banks. And so if you look at a lot of the features that both the Federal Reserve and the uh, Hoover administration took in the, the last year of the Depression, they were almost entirely focused on this creating shiftability in long-term assets. They said the short-term market has basically run its course. We've tried everything we can. But if we increase shiftability and liquidity, give people confidence that the Federal Reserve or one of its new facilities will buy up these assets, then increasingly people will invest in it. Hopefully that will create the the sort of fixed investment we need. And this was the the whole with the wholehearted support of John Maynard Keynes and others. This is even he was John Maynard Keynes. I quoted the saying, too, at one point that I would be OK with less short term uh, money and deposits available if you had more short long term assets on the, uh, the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. It, he was a full hearted advocate of this kind of operation twist idea, even more so in a sense than the Federal Reserve. Uh, but that was a, a significant motivator for most of their actions in that period. Yeah, if you ask most people today, when was the original Operation Twist, they'd say, oh, 1961, because we had one in 2011. And in fact, people at the Fed would point back, oh, let's see what happened in 1961. But this is striking because the original one was the early 30s. And all these steps are just, it's very interesting, amazing that they were taking these efforts to lower long-term interest rates. And you mentioned, you know, they, they were limited, so they did you know, the refinance corporation, the home lending bank. But in 1935, they made some changes so they could explicitly themselves do more um, long-term investing. But let me, yes. let me switch gears now. So they, they were taking concrete steps. They changed the law in 1935 or helped, you know, helped Congress move in that direction so they could take more explicit steps. But what role did that have or how did that affect the recovery? Because you also argue in the paper that despite their efforts to influence long-term rates, it also contributed to some kind of complacency that they weren't paying as close attention to other indicators in the economy that were signaling things might be worse than they think they are. Um, yeah, so I, I should be clear that in my paper, I, I don't try to take a, a, a firm stance on what was the, the correct way to view monetary policy at the time or which was the best way to view it. Uh, I frankly don't have the econometric chops to do that as well as many other people could. Uh, but I do think there could be a misreading of this rifler Keynes doctrine and to say that, well, look, if we look at what the Federal Reserve was doing at this time, they were very activists. They were acting in a way we think a lot of new Keynesian policymakers say they should act. Uh, they were focused on fixed investment, long-term rates, and so on. Uh, 
but clearly, if we're just looking at the effects, they are disastrous. By any measure, uh, Federal Reserve policy was clearly a failure in this period. So in a sense, whatever the rightfuler Keynes doctrine uh, was saying they should do and whatever its actual impacts were, they probably weren't entirely positive. Uh, so on one level, I have a couple quotes uh, from periods like September 1930 uh, and January 1931, where some of the major Federal Reserve policymakers are saying, look, because the short term rates aren't having a long term effect, then we don't want to loosen monetary policy anymore. Or at the same time, when they say, well, look, long term interest rates are already quite low. And therefore, uh, according to our doctrine, this we don't have any need for increased lending. Uh, now, many other research in the Federal Reserve say, well, that's beca probably because in many sense, short term and long term interest rates aren't a great measure of the efficacy of monetary policy. Uh, Milton Friedman, of course, looked at something like M2. While we wouldn't look at that today, maybe some other sort of measure of how activists or uh, our contractionary monetary policy was, such as uh, a broad measure of money or nominal gross domestic product, which I know you're a fan of. Yep. Uh, would probably be a better indicator of what uh, whether the Federal Reserve was being activist or not in this period. And I think in many ways, this focus on even long term interest rates was a, a distraction because they weren't seeing how the collapsing price level, the collapsing credit uh, amount of deposits in commercial banks, all of which they had available. If you look at their their open market committee meetings and elsewhere, they had all of these charts exactly like we have today, pretty much that showed all of these collapsing indicators, uh, but they ignored them because they were overwhelmingly focused on these long-term interest rates, which were providing bad signals about the stance of monetary policy and were telling them either that monetary policy was ineffective or that uh, insofar as it changed the long-term rate wasn't having real effect on investment. And when compared against what was actually happening, clearly monetary policy could have been much more expansionary. Okay, so let's go back to the real bills doctrine which Alan Meltzer and a lot of others have argued was the reason the Fed was timid in its response. How do you weight these these two stories? So is, is there any truth to the real bills doctrine? And if so, um, you know, how important was that uh, view in making the Fed timid versus the view you've outlined in your paper? Uh, so, I mean, I think you could find a few true blue believers in the real bills doctrine. I mentioned someone like George Norris in the Philadelphia Bank, uh, John Calkins over here in my local San Francisco Reserve Bank, and uh, McDougal over at Chicago. But the majority of the of the 12 uh, Federal Open Market Committee seem to be much closer believers in the the. Eugene Meyer, George Harrison belief in pushing long term rates. Okay. Uh, and as Alan Meltzer himself said, you know, basically when George Harrison recommended a change, the, the rest of the banks were very likely to listen to him. Uh, so both, both ideas certainly had an impact on the Fed this period, and I wouldn't totally exclude one or the other. But if you look again, both at what the, the major policymakers were thinking and doing and at what the President Hoover administration was doing, uh, they seem to be following closest to the Reifler, Reifler Keynes ideas. Well, you realize, Judge, your paper is overthrowing a, a lot of um, <laughs> literature here, right? Because a lot of literature points to real bills doctrine being very important. So I, I, I expect this paper to be widely cited. Um, <laughs> or maybe widely widely cited to argue with, but that's okay, too. Of course. <laughs> as long as they spell your name right and cite you properly. That, that's, I, I'm perfectly fine <laughs> with that. But yeah, so it's as I don't want to dismiss as... as uh, Alan Meltzer and uh, and Friedman and Schwartz themselves and others have pointed out the real bills doctrines were real, were important at the time. They existed. People believed in them. Uh, but it's interesting. If you look even to Alan Meltzer or Friedman and Schwartz's quotes to them, they'll have a lot of quotes in their in their works about uh, long term interest rates and the attention that these policymakers paid to long term interest rates. But they won't kind of put those together into a coherent vision of that, I think, partially because this sort of this prehistory of the Great Depression, thinking on monetary policy, institutionalist, was a little bit orthogonal to the main trend of, of monetary thought in the period. People like Wesley Clare Mitchell and Harold Moulton and Winfield Reifler, people didn't really think as, as huge monetary theorists. But uh, in, at least in this area and in a few other places, like their influence on John Maynard Keynes, I think you can see that they were pretty crucial. 
So your article really paints the picture that the Rifler Keynes doctrine was was widely understood at the time. It was very influential at the Fed. President Hoover bought into it, and he he you know he did a, a Trump move on the Fed because he <laughs> believed. So th- this view was an important view at the time. So my question is, how did we forget it? Why is it only 2019 that a researcher named Judge Glock went in and found it and has published a paper on it? That, that seems to me a, a, a glaring hole in the literature. Uh, well, I think partially because I think if I had to give a main reason, I think uh, people did not look too seriously at the institutionalist economists that, uh, that I cited originally. Uh, so the institutionalist, uh, for those of your listeners not familiar with it, they tended to be much more obsessed with uh, the sort of societal and economic structures that affected the economy than other economists. They were somewhat outside the mainstream Marshallian ideas about uh, they were more focused on supply and demand curves, about marginal changes. Uh, and so a lot of people tended to think they didn't have a very coherent, clear idea about monetary policy, or if they did, it wasn't that important. Uh, but I and even though the, the term institutional economist can be fairly capacious, uh, I think, and a few other people, look at Perry Marilyn, uh, the most important of which, uh, I think you can see that they, in a lot of different ways, they had impact on economists we do think are much more important, John Maynard Keynes, of course, but also people like Lachlan Curry, who was a major uh, believer in this doctrine and major economist at the Federal Reserve during the early Roosevelt administration, uh, and Mariner Eccles, a later Federal Reserve board chair, who basically uh, would repeat a lot of these uh, conversations or these a lot these ideas that George Harrison did um, in the early years of the Roosevelt administration as well. So I think this sort of previous uh, background of monetary thought wasn't appreciated or was seen as sort of uh, assumed, just like a lot of these ideas seem commonsensical to us today. They uh, they don't they don't seem so radical as they were viewed at the period. Uh, but they did have an important, they clearly had an important impact. And I hope, uh, in a sense, we can only, uh, I can only mention a few of the quotes here, but I hope that uh, the bulk of them in the paper shows exactly how often and clearly people were promulgating these views. And we will provide a link to the paper so listeners can read the paper for themselves. They can see the footnotes and, and explore this issue themselves. We only have a few minutes left, Judge, and I want to ask a, a, another question kind of to kind of wrap this all up. Um, we mentioned earlier that there were really two stories told for the Great Depression. One is the timid response of the Federal Reserve in the U.S. The other is, is kind of the global story, which is the mechanism was the interwar gold center that transmitted and made this a global phenomenon. So um, – in your view, you know, what was more important for the U.S.? Was was it the global Great Depression or was it this adherence to the Rifler Keynes doctrine and the Federal Reserve's timidity that uh, was important in creating the Great Depression? Uh, well, I, I guess I, I think that they're, they're very closely related. So okay. the, the Federal Reserve – and the United States had basically around 35% of the world's global gold stock at the, at the beginning of the Great Depression. And their amount of gold actually increased over the next two years, basically till uh, the dollar came under attack after England left the gold standard and some thought the United States would be the next to, to fall. Uh, but so in a sense, not only did the U.S. have a massively disproportionate amount of gold in this period, they continued to increase it during the uh, the majority of the Great Depression. Uh, so insofar as the Federal Reserve was being excessively tight, again, depending on how we uh, measure or, or uh, describe that tightness or we think about that tightness, uh, and the rifler Keynes doctrine contributed to that, then that was certainly contributing to the, to the global depression. Uh, but at the same time, I think there's a lot to be said for, for the work of Iken Green and Scott Sumners and others who, should, Summers and others who show that uh, places are Doug Irwin as well, places like France, which was accumulating vastly more gold reserves in this period than even the United States. They went from about 7% to about 27% of uh, global gold reserves at the, at this, during this period. Uh, 
uh, they must have had a, a major contribution to, to the world economic collapse. And as we mentioned before, the, an important part of the Great Depression's story is that it was global. It affected countries all across the world. Uh, but insofar as the U.S. had a massive amount of the world's gold, they were going to be, uh, an, in a sense, a, an important conductor of what was happening everywhere. And the rifler Keynes doctrine might have contributed to them being excessively tight in this period. Okay, so they are complementary stories and they help us, yeah, I think so. And they help us understand what's going on here domestically with broad implications globally. Well, our time is up. Our guest today has been Judge Glock. Judge, thank you for coming on the show. Uh, thank you so much, David. Real pleasure. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.